It's not too often one reports seeing or having indications of a cryptid with a normal animal. If they are believed to be real, however, humans can't be the only things they interact with, and not every animal out there is vulnerable to them. This is not a report I myself witnessed, but instead one my grandmother told me about and then my aunt told me at a later time, so I think they're pretty trustworthy. At the time I'll note, there wasn't much talk of Dogman, as this was about a decade before the infamous song even came out. Though, there was talk about wolves or werewolf-like monsters in Appalachia for a long time, so my aunt and grandmother just always called it that wolf thing or that wolf creature. For a little background, my grandparents' house, which is currently my aunt's home now, is in the backwoods of western Grayson County, Virginia, which to this day is still sparsely populated outside one or two large towns on the east side. And back then, it was even less so. It has extremely thick forests with hilly terrain in all directions. You have to get on a dirt path and follow it for about half a mile to get to a gravel-covered side road, and then follow it for about 30 minutes to reach a very small town just across the North Carolina border. If you go a short ways north, you find yourself at the Big Blue Ridge Mountains and the parkway that leads up to them in Appalachia proper. The forest is mostly low-lying shrubs, up to around four feet high, with pine and a lot of black oak trees making up the canopy. There is a very clear stream about 30 yards from the house, which has fish quite frequently. This, along with blackberries, tender leaf shrubs, and some apple trees, make it a very lucrative place for wildlife. The house itself is an old two-story house built onto an incline of the hill that overlooks it. Now this was back in the 1970s. My aunt believes it was about 1978, as she was finishing up high school at the time. My father had graduated from college already and was going on to the Air Force so he'd already moved out. My grandfather, although he was old enough to retire, liked to remain busy, so he worked his old job as an electrician and a power pole technician. Just now in more of an advisory role because he was getting up there in age. He'd just gotten the contract down in North Carolina, so he was away from the house for about a week and a half. This left only my 17-year-old aunt and my grandmother at the house. As I said, usually there was a lot of wildlife in the area. A typical morning for my grandmother was making breakfast and sitting out on the porch watching deer and rabbits eat the shrubs. Sometimes she would also see or hear a bobcat or a fox or a coyote about. On one occasion, a mountain lion and her cubs strolled right past the house. One animal she was familiar with was a very large black bear. It could be easily recognized from the folks around these parts because of a white patch on his chest and a hole in his left ear. My grandmother nicknamed him Captain because he had a habit of sitting on his haunches and reaching up with his paws to pick apples, a motion that looked to her like he was saluting. Captain was a very big black bear, but wasn't very aggressive unless tested. He seemed to have an agreement with my grandmother and grandfather that if they left him alone, he'd do the same for them. He just strolled by the house every now and then to have some blackberries on the bushes or apples that had fallen down, which meant he came by the house's yard often as he was too big to climb trees much more, and the fruit trees around the house were low enough so he could reach up and pick food. My grandmother and grandfather guesstimated he was somewhere in the 500 to 600 pound range and roughly six feet tall as my grandfather once measured some scratch marks he'd left on a tree. During that week, my grandmother noticed a fairly sharp decline in the animals nearby. It was the latter part of a summer and in a wet season, so most of the plants were in full bloom and the leaves were at their tenderest. Yet, she couldn't see hide nor hair of any rabbits or deer coming through. The coyote she heard yapping every night for the past month seemed to vanish as well. A few neighbors, and by neighbors, I mean people who lived within five miles, who stopped by to tell her something had taken their dog and their chicken coop had been smashed into. They assumed it was a mountain lion that lurked about and had done it since it was the only other thing that could feasibly take down a large farm dog, as they had seen Captain, the only other predator nearby, 
that was big enough to take down the 80 plus pound lab. The day after, in a completely different area, gorging himself on a dead deer. They checked around, but couldn't find anything. The next night, my grandmother was woken up by my aunt, who told her that she had heard something bang against the outside of her wall. They checked around in the morning, and found one of the deer butchered with a bloody smear on the wall. Judging from the way the gravel was disturbed, the deer had been walking by the house when something ambushed it, and in the struggle, it got smacked against the wall. My grandmother, having grown up in the woods, was very familiar with predator kills and methods. Mountain lions tend to jump on the back and rake their claws across the flanks to hold on as they bite the neck. Black bears will usually break the neck or back with their paws while biting the head. And on the rare occasion coyotes attack deer, they usually do it by biting down on the insides of the legs and twisting to rip the muscles and arteries. This kill, however, had clearly had the throat ripped out, but there weren't any claw marks to be found, and the bite looked narrower than the cougar could do. Plus, she could gander there was only one, and the way the ground was disturbed told her that, which didn't make sense for coyotes, as they typically hunted in pairs, since just one alone isn't usually big enough to bring down a full-grown deer. After disposing of the carcass, the next few nights were relatively uneventful, except for the fact several times my aunt or grandmother would be woken up in the middle of the night by the sound of something panting outside. Now in these woods, you can hear a pin drop if it's close enough, and at some points, they could swear the animal making the panting noise was directly outside the wall. One day, my grandmother was picking some berries when she noticed what looked like dog tracks of a very large hound going through a mud flat bordering the nearby stream. Thinking it might be the missing farm dog who had maybe just run away, she followed the tracks until she heard something loudly growling at her from across the stream. She looked up to see the partially obscured face of what looked like a large, bulky, brown-colored coyote, or wolf, standing in a thicket on the other side of the stream. She quickly began to back away, glancing back only to check her footing on the slope that led down to the stream. When she looked back, she saw a very distinctly canine face in much greater detail, because the animal had moved out from under the cover. But instead of stepping out on the leaves like she thought it did at first, she soon noticed that it was instead standing up on its hind legs and peering over the shrubs. Now, she had seen canines stand upright before. Dogs do it. Foxes can do it. Sometimes coyotes even do it. It was the size that took her off guard. She had been to that exact same thicket of shrubs just a few days before, and her head only just barely reached the top. My grandmother was around 5'3". This thing had its head pitched clear over the shrubs with a little bit of extra visibility. When a predator is making no attempt to hide, it's usually because it's trying to intimidate someone or something. My grandmother managed to back away from the hill without turning around, and when she started to get out of sight of the creature, it stepped out of the thicket on its hind legs. It strolled forward in a very uncanny way. She had trouble describing it, but she insisted it never went back down on all fours. Needless to say, she ran to the house in a backpedal sprint. That night, they heard the panting again, along with a distant howl and scraping noises. They found the garage door, the back door frame, and the kitchen window frame. All had claw marks on them the next day, from something investigating them. The canine creature was seen a few more times across the week by my grandmother and the neighbors usually on or near the area of my family's property. And then my aunt finally saw it, when she saw a pair of fuzzy ears outside of her window. Now, she wasn't startled right off the bat, because Captain had sometimes come by her window, and a few times before that, she had gradually lost some fear of the big bear over the years. But, in his case, his ears were just barely able to reach the edge of the window, whereas in this case, you could clearly see them and the top of the owner's head. She quickly realized it wasn't the bear, especially because of the pointed shape of the ears, the brown coloring, and the fact that both of the ears were fully intact. They also started to detect a very pungent smell on the side door porch, 
one time finding what looked like some urine or some other liquid stains on it, suggesting an animal had marked its scent to claim the spot. It all came to a head on a Wednesday night, when they heard the howling in the distance growing closer. My grandmother flipped the switch on a porch light and glimpsed the canine animal quickly sprinting across the lawn. It was still on its hind legs. Her sighting now confirmed just how big it was. She'd seen timber wolves at the zoo, up to 150 pounds, and she was certain that this was at least twice that size, maybe even bigger. For several hours of the night, they could hear it roaming around the property and pressing against the doors like it was trying to find a way in. They glimpsed at several points, eye shine of yellow eyes peering in through the windows, as well as broad, long-fingered paws being pushed against the glass. This was the day and age before cell phones and 24-hour police service in some rural areas, so no one had the means of immediately calling the police. Instead, my grandmother had to wait arduous minutes on a dial line with connection difficulty, trying to call the police station two towns over. She was distracted by my aunt screaming, running into the bedroom to get one of the guns out. She'd been sitting in the living room when she felt clicking against the glass and saw that wolf thing pressing its face and bare teeth against the surface with its claws fully outstretched. Both of them started to try to get the rifles or shotguns out. It was becoming increasingly clear to them that the creature was trying to get into the house and they knew that it knew they were in there. They heard it panting through a wall before there was a sound of heavy footsteps and a very loud thump with a flash of fur on the edge of the window. They ran to the innermost portion of the house, the pantry locker, and they stayed there with the guns. Now, it's not like in the movies, when creatures roar, snarl, and hiss constantly, no matter what they're doing. But they did hear a commotion outside. My aunt and grandmother hadn't the faintest idea what was going on, and didn't dare investigate until the morning after. But they could tell something was antagonizing something else, as occasional grunts, barks, and rumbles were audible through the blackness for about a minute, and then gradually, both parties moved off. The next morning, they found no bodies, but there had clearly been a ferocious altercation. The ground was ripped up in multiple spots. The wall had a dent in it, and there were some oxidized blood traces on the grass and dirt. My grandmother also found a trail where something had charged through the shrubs and recovered several vague dog prints as well as wider track marks moving in the same direction. The animals all seemed to come back by the end of the week, and the howls had stopped after that. When my grandfather came back home, he, my aunt, and some neighbors surveyed the area to make sure they couldn't find that wolf creature anywhere. Evidently, the neighbors had also heard howls on their property at night, and that stopped recently too. They couldn't find it, despite surveying the whole property, though they did find what looked like a trackway leading off the property and running off into the mountains. Several days later, my grandmother saw Captain again, marking his territory by rubbing up against a tree in their yard and scratching the bark. She noted several cuts across his muzzle. He was missing patches of fur and some what looked like healed bite wounds on his arm and the hole in his ear had been torn open to the point he was missing half of the ear flap. But other than that, and a slight limp that went away with time, he was fine. My aunt even joked that he looked rather proud of himself. When my grandfather was told about the urine-like smell on the doorstep, when the wolf creature was running amuck, he speculated it was trying to claim the territory, and surmised since usually black bears are relatively docile, Captain evidently took up issue with the newcomer imposing on his space and at that point became aggressive. So what my grandmother and aunt heard that night was Captain charging while it was distracted and engaging the intruder. While the wolf-looking creature was taller, it seemed skinnier and less massive, and apparently in a confrontation and threat displays that likely followed, Sheer bulk won out. Apparently, 
This thing decided it wasn't worth claiming this spot if it meant having to square off with a quarter ton of claws and teeth for it. They guessed Captain had run the intruder off to protect his territory, and coincidentally, helped my family too. As a special thank you, and so he can recover his strength quicker, my grandmother trimmed the apple tree down with all the fruit and let the bear enjoy himself without feeding him directly. She didn't want him to associate humans with food. Winter would be in a few months, and she wanted him fattened up so he could stick around for the next year, just in case that thing came back. As she put it, the forest will always have a boss, and it's better to have one who's not interested in eating you. Since that story, decades have gone by, and while both my grandparents and Captain have passed, the dogman creature never returned. There's been about three black bears who've moved into Captain's place since, and each has grown about as big as he was. Thankfully, that seems to have been enough to ward off any large werewolf creatures. My encounter took place many years ago. I never had the faintest explanation for it until a couple of months ago when I randomly stumbled across Dogmen on the internet. I was in my early 20s working swing shifts at the time and commuting about 100 miles each way, so it was usually around 2 in the morning by the time I got home. I call it the Monster, and when I saw it, it was on the northernmost section of Trunk Road in Matanuska Valley in Alaska. This area is almost smack between the towns of Palmer and Wasilla. I was only about 10 miles from home at that point, so it must have been around 2 a.m. Trunk Road is a narrow two-lane road consisting of nothing but twists and turns. The surrounding terrain is somewhat swampy and thick with black spruce. It was late October, days from Halloween actually. There was no snow on the ground, but it was cold enough to be wary of ice. I was driving an 82 Subaru, going about 20 miles an hour around a curve, when my headlights caught a large dark figure up ahead. I'm bad at judging distance, maybe six car lengths away? I instinctively let off the gas, coasting closer. At first, I assumed it was a moose, as this area is infested with them. But no, it was standing upright. Bear then? No, not a bear. It looked so strange tall enough to be an uncommonly large bear, but far too slender, and it looked like it had spikes running down its neck and back. Maybe it was a Halloween prop. It was odd, but it was an effective place to put one. All those thoughts ran through my head in a fraction of a second. The car was still coasting closer, and I could see more details. It was standing in profile, gazing across the road. I could clearly see its wolfish muzzle, large upright ears, and the spikes on its back turned out to be clumps of fur. Its spine curved in a smooth, very natural looking way. It was standing in the ditch, inches from the pavement. Because I was focused on its upper body, I do not recall anything about the back legs or if it had a tail. I did see its front legs though, very dog looking, hanging awkwardly down and slightly towards its front, exactly as you'd expect if a dog stood upright. While it clearly had a canine look, there was still something off about it that I couldn't articulate. It was perfectly still, and at this point, given the proximity to Halloween, I was quite convinced it was some sort of Halloween prop, because it was clearly not any kind of existing animal. I was deeply impressed, and gently stepped on the brakes. I wanted to stop and take a good look at it. Then, it turned its head towards me. In the tiny fraction of a second that it took it to swivel its head, I knew that I made a terrible mistake. The fluidness of the movement removed any and all doubt that this was some kind of prop. It was horribly, terrifyingly alive. The pale, off-white glow of its eyeshine in the headlights destroyed any possibility of a human in a costume, too. I think I sat there, gaping at this in shock for a few seconds. The car barely moving by now, but still inching closer. As I was almost upon it, I think it could have leaned towards me and touched the car if it wanted to. I had to look up to see its face. 
Again, I remind you that I'm a bad judge of such things, but I'm five foot four inches, and it was a hell of a lot taller than me. Tall like a polar bear, standing. Maybe seven, eight feet? I can't really say. I snapped out of my trance and slammed on the gas. The car fishtailed, and I prepared myself for death by monster, as I was certain I'd end up in the ditch. But the tires caught the pavement, and I drove like a complete maniac all the way home. I didn't look back. I've only been on that section of the road a few times since then, never alone and never in the dark. For the next several years of driving that commute, I went 20 plus miles out of the way just to avoid trunk road. The thing never made any aggressive move, but there was something about it that felt very predatory. I've never seen anything remotely like it again, and I've never heard any stories about it in that area either. Hello, my name is Meadow Fuller. I am 18 years old and live in Taylor, Mississippi. I'm a straight-A student. I play soccer. I don't drink or do drugs. And I come from a strict household. With that, I want to admit to you that I saw a dog man two years ago when I was home alone on a Saturday night during the summer. It scared me to death because it wasn't something I ever expected to see. I know a lot of stories come out of our town, and now I know they're real. When it happened, it was after 10 o'clock. My parents were at my aunt and uncle's house for an adult's night, and I had begged them to leave me by myself so I could use the big screen in the living room to watch a movie. I was about halfway through it when I had to use the bathroom, so I paused it and got up to pee. While I was sitting in the bathroom, I could have sworn that something passed by the window, like a shadow or something. It was really fast, but blocked out the whole window, so it had to be pretty large. It freaked me out at first, but I thought it could have been a car driving by or something. The bathroom faces the street, and only our yard separates the house from the street. We have one of those windows that you can't see out of. Light just shines through during the day, but you can't see in or out. I shook off my nervous feeling and told myself it was just because I was home alone and watching a scary movie. In retrospect, I should have listened to my gut because I really believe that's the same thing I saw that ran by the bathroom window. Either way, I went to the living room and finished the movie, not really thinking about it after a while. When the movie finished, I got up from the couch and I realized that I hadn't seen my cat, Jim Morrison, the whole time I was in front of the TV. That was weird. Usually he's curled up on your legs if you're on the couch, or he's sitting in front of you blocking your view, trying to get some attention. He didn't do either of those things. It wasn't a big deal, really. Sometimes he runs outside when the door's open and explores the backyard, or perches up in a tree in the front yard. We have a pretty good-sized backyard. Lots of grass, lots of area for him to roam. There's also this hilly area in the back that slopes down to the bottom of the property. There's a six-foot fence after that. There's no lights away in the back, so it can get pretty spooky at night. Usually, if I go out there at night, I stay on the patio, or at least the area in the grass that the light still illuminates. You can kind of see back there, but it always just kind of creeped me out. I started calling for Morrison around the house, but he didn't come, even when I opened a can of his favorite wet food. I decided he most definitely was outside. So then I went out to check on him. I went out front first to check the tree that he normally hangs around in, but I didn't see him. I shined my flashlight up there, but there was nothing up there. I called him a couple times. Nothing. It was weirdly quiet in the neighborhood, like no dogs or anything at all, but I really didn't think anything of it either way. So I went back inside and headed to the backyard. When I got back there, I was really creeped out right from the start. I can't really explain it. I just had this feeling in my gut that something was wrong. It was really quiet back there, too. I just wanted to find Morrison and get the hell back into the house. I called to him, probably a little too quietly, but he didn't respond. There was also this really strong smell of dog urine or something like that. I'm assuming it's dog urine, or at least dog man urine. I've never smelled anything like it. It was very strong, very potent. 
It smelled a lot like ammonia. Then I also got this whiff of something else, too. It was disgusting, like a dog that's been rolling around in dead animals or something. You know how some dogs like to roll in things that smell really bad? Well, it smelled like that. It didn't really do anything to help my nerves, either. I was just about to go back into the house and give up my search when Morrison came running at me like the devil was chasing him. His hair was all standing up, and he was yowling and hissing like crazy. He ran right into the house and darted around the corner. He was really spooked and didn't even notice that I was there. Then I heard this deep growling noise from that hilly area that I talked about. I turned around, thinking it was a dog from the neighborhood or something. Nope, not a dog. Definitely something else. To me, it looked like a werewolf. I knew what it was. I heard the stories before, but I never believed them. I was face to face at that moment with a dog man. It was coming towards me on all fours. By the way it moved, it was like it was army crawling or something. Like a big cat that was getting ready to pounce on its prey. And it was monstrous. Even on four legs, it looked like it must have been five feet tall. It had shaggy fur that was this dark brown color, but from the shadows it looked like it could have been black. The front legs looked more human than wolf, like the way it bent them had this human quality to it. The head was really, really big. It looked exactly like the head of a wolf, but enlarged and put on this creature's shoulders. Ears, muzzle, it was all very canine looking to me. I shined my light on it, and I screamed. I screamed my head off. I don't know if I scared it, or if it didn't want the trouble of this wailing girl, but whatever the reason, it pivoted around, came up on two feet, and sprinted back to the fence, and then leapt clear over it. I mean, it cleared the six-foot fence with no problem at all. When it turned around, I got a better look at it, especially when it stood up on two legs. The back legs were very muscular, more so than the front, and the way it swung the front arms gave it more of a human quality than it did when it was on the ground. The paws didn't look canine to me. They looked more human, but I didn't get a very good look at it. After reading a lot of descriptions of this thing, I think it's safe for me to assume that the paws were really hands, and they could grab things, like a raccoon. It had a wide chest, maybe one and a half times the size of my dad's. But the thing that really got to me was how tall this thing was when it stood up on two legs. It was hunched over as it ran, so I can't get a perfect description of the height, but it had to be passing the seven foot mark. This thing looked like it would tower over me if it got close to me. And when the light hit its face, you could see scars on its snout and yellow eyes. I'm not too sure if it had a tail or not, because it moved so fast when it got up and turned around. The way it moved didn't seem natural, like it shouldn't be that fast and it shouldn't be that graceful for its size. It was really fast, I can't stress that enough. It only took maybe two or three seconds for it to pivot, stand, and run and jump over the fence. Believe me, I don't think it took me much longer to dart back into the house and call my parents in hysterics. I told them that there was some kind of creature outside, and I thought it was a dogman that everybody was talking about. They came home soon after that, since they weren't too far away from our house, and my aunt and uncle were with them too. My mom and my aunt stayed in the house to calm me down and had me explain what I'd seen while my dad and uncle went around the area with their guns. They believed me, because of course they've heard all the stories from around here too, but they didn't find anything when they were outside. They did say that they could smell the urine too, and that confirms to them that there was at least some kind of creature out there. I didn't sleep that night, and I had a hard time sleeping for a few weeks after that, actually. I'd have these dreams about that thing, where it would either chase me or come into the house. They were so vivid that I would wake up drenched in my own sweat. Luckily, that thing never came back. Talking about it around here is kind of like this big secret. It's very taboo. Some people just clam up and refuse to indulge in the conversation. I know a couple people, though, that are rumored to have seen it, too. And if I get them to talk to me, I'll email you their encounters, too. I don't let Morrison out at night anymore, either. I would feel awful if something happened to him. 
Just because we haven't seen it doesn't mean that thing isn't still out there. Especially around these parts where that creature is kind of a problem. I know you've heard several stories from this part of the world and I can assure you Dogman is real and there's a lot of them around here. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this and I hope it makes it to your channel one day. Have a good night. Meadow. A few years ago, my kids and I were traveling to my parents' house in Michigan, which is about a 12-hour drive from our home. It was on this trip that we encountered a dog man. A little backstory before I get into it is that my wife and I had split the spring before this encounter. I guess she just found someone else that she'd rather spend her time with. And we had agreed to split our kids' time this summer in two-week chunks between us. It had been a while since my parents got to spend any time with them, so the three of us decided to take a road trip and stay there for a week. At the time, my son was 11 and my daughter was only 7. On the highway we were on, there's a long stretch of fields about four hours into the drive. There's literally nothing but fields for miles and miles. It's a pretty boring drive. At this point, the kids were asleep and I was lost in thought about this and that. There was one other car on the highway other than me that I could see anyways, and it was pretty far ahead of me. All of a sudden, I saw something running in the field next to my car. Now, mind you, the grass in these fields isn't too tall, probably only a foot at most, so I could clearly see the thing next to me. I looked over casually at first, half expecting it to be a horse or something, but it was definitely not a horse. This thing looked like a giant wolf. It was running on all fours, but it was still massively tall, probably five feet if I had to guess. I want to stress just how massive this thing was. The head was gigantic, twice the size of a full-grown wolf, and its fur was shaggy. It had a huge mouth and big, long ears on the top of its head. It was dark brown and had a long, bushy tail. And this thing was hauling ass. It kept looking over my way as it ran. I didn't know what to do. I wanted to call out to my kids, but I didn't want to scare them. And this thing would have definitely scared them. Stupidly, I blurted out a few choice words, and that was enough to stir my son, who then woke up and looked out of the window. Once he saw the creature running next to our car, he started yelling in fright which woke up my daughter. She looked out of the window too and started screaming. The only thing I could do for my children at this point were to promise them that I would never ever let anything happen to them and they needed to calm down. Then I noticed the wolf was running at an angle, an angle directly towards our car, and it was panting. This is when I had a glimmer of hope, so I sped up hoping to outrun this thing, or at least drive fast enough and long enough to wear it out to where it would stop chasing us. I kept glancing down at my speed, 65, 70, 75 miles per hour. I started making some distance between us and the wolf, but it was still chasing the car. This thing had stamina that I had never seen. Another car passed by us in the other direction and was blaring on the horn. I'm not sure if it was because I was driving so fast, or if they saw the monster chasing our car. I'll never know the answer to that. Once I hit 80 miles per hour, it stopped chasing us altogether. My kids were watching through the back window, crying from fear, but not being able to pull themselves away either. And I was too wrapped up in outrunning this thing to tell them that they needed to sit down and not look at the monster that was chasing us. I looked in the rear mirror and saw this thing stand up on two legs. What the hell? What kind of wolf stands up on two legs? I swear I almost lost control of the car at this point because I was so dumbfounded by what I had just seen. I mean, being chased by an uber wolf is bad enough, but then this thing stands up on two legs? 
I had seriously entered the twilight zone. I was forced to return my attention to the road and concentrate on driving, since I had no intentions of slowing down. My daughter kept me up to date as she sobbed from the back seat. She told me that the monster watched us drive, Daddy, then it ran away like a dog. When I asked her what she meant, she told me it had dropped down to all fours again and ran off in the other direction. I slowed down just a little bit, but at the rate that I was going, I was still definitely breaking the speed limit, and I drove that way until we reached the next town. Both of my children were still hysterical, and I did my best to try to calm them down. We stopped and got ice cream, but it didn't help much. My daughter was still so worked up that she vomited all of her ice cream up. When we finally reached my parents' house, we were all exhausted and quiet, which really worried my parents, and I just told them we had a bad drive. I fully planned on telling them the next day. I just didn't have it in me to relive that encounter so quickly, because truthfully, I was still pretty upset myself. I couldn't sleep that night. My mind was too busy trying to rationalize what we had seen. Neither of the kids slept that night either. They were too scared. They finally passed out in my bed around four and slept until about noon. I felt so bad for them, and I was worried that the innocence that they still had would be shattered forever because of the thing that was chasing us. While the kids were sleeping the next morning, I sat down with my parents and explained what had happened. They knew that I wasn't lying. I just have never lied to them, so they had no reason to think that I was lying to them now. My dad got up and put his hand on my shoulder, like he does every time he's about to give me important advice. And he told me, son, I believe you. I've never seen anything like that myself. But I know there are things out there that nobody talks about because they're so unbelievable. And maybe you should keep this to yourself. At first, I was really taken aback because my dad isn't the type to give two craps about what people's opinions are. But as I sat outside and thought about his words, I realized that he was right. Not because I cared about what other people thought, but if word got out that me and my kids were chased by a werewolf, or at least something that looks remarkably like a werewolf, they were going to start throwing around words like crazy and hallucinating and that I was using drugs. I couldn't afford to have the evil ex-wife using that against me. So I decided to keep this encounter to myself. Once the kids woke up, I sat down with them and told them what Grandpa had said and how we couldn't let people know what we saw because it might make it so I couldn't see them anymore. Always the clever one, my son boiled it down to the simplest form for my daughter. If mom tells people that dad's crazy, she won't let him see us anymore. That made her cry again, and she promised that she wouldn't say anything. I remember her sticking her little pinky out at me and saying, I pinky promise, daddy. I felt horrible putting the burden of this horrible secret on my children. But there was nothing else that could have been done. For the rest of the week, we had a mostly enjoyable time. My parents were extra lovey to the kids because of what had happened. And of course, they spoiled them rotten. But I still had one looming dread the whole week. And that was the drive home. It made me sick to my stomach to think of driving down that highway again. So we ended up taking a detour that added an extra two hours onto the drive. But I didn't care. I just wanted to bypass that highway. I haven't driven that road since. Nothing on earth or heaven will ever get me onto that highway again. Why would that thing chase us if not for a malicious reason? I doubt it was because that's what it does for fun. What would have happened if it caught up to us? I shudder just thinking about it.
English is not my first language. You may change whatever you need to to make my story make more sense. I live in Mexico, in a place called Michoacan. There is an area here called the Balsas Forest. That is where I saw something that I could not explain all those years ago when my friend and I were just young boys. We kept it to ourselves until years later. For many years, I thought what we saw was a werewolf or a skinwalker, but I now know it's something called a dogman. My friend and I went out to the forest to camp, but we also went out there to get into trouble. We were young boys and thought we knew everything. We just wanted to have a good time without any adults to tell us what to do. Our parents didn't even know we had been out there because we each told them we were sleeping at the other's house. We didn't think anything about our little lie. We didn't know what was going to happen. We had planned to do this for a whole week before we actually left for our trip. My friend had packed lots of things to eat. My job was to sneak away a small tent that my parents kept in our shed. I also took the blankets and sleeping bags that they had and hid them away from the house a few hours before we hiked into the woods. Once we arrived, we made our tent and some sandwiches, then decided to explore the forest. We tried catching snakes and lizards for a little bit, until we both smelled a very powerful, disgusting smell that made you want to retch. We laughed as we blamed each other for the smell, but it was very strong and my friend wanted to go back to our tent. I wanted to search for what was making the smell, thinking that maybe it was a large dead animal. My friend ended up agreeing to look around, but once we did, we did not find anything and the smell started to disappear. We did hear the footsteps of something large moving away from us. It sounded very heavy, but we weren't able to catch sight of it. We were both frightened, but both acted brave because we didn't want to show each other any fear. I believe these two things that we experienced were the same monster that we ran into later that night. They both had the same disgusting smell and that thing we laid eyes on was a very large animal. Around dinner time, we were sitting at our tent eating again when we heard this very loud, primal scream from somewhere in the forest. It sounded human and animal at the same time. That made me want to leave right then and there. My friend asked me what could possibly make that noise, but I had no idea. I suggested that we leave instead of camping, and he agreed. We considered leaving the tent and all of our belongings there, but decided we should take them with us because of the trouble that we could get into if they were lost. Not soon after we were packing up, though, we heard those loud footsteps again, but they were very close now. Too close. Whatever was making them sounded very heavy and was very clearly on two legs, not four. We decided that maybe it was a crazy person or even just someone joking with us, and that seemed to calm us down a little bit, but just a small amount. We had still made up our mind to leave. My friend thought we should hide until it went away and then pack up the rest of our stuff afterwards. I didn't have a problem with that. I was more frightened than I would admit to him. We hid in some bushes as the noises got louder and we could smell that terrible smell again. I really thought I was going to throw up from the stink of it. We both held our breath as it got really close. We were about to see who was making that noise, but the who turned out to be a what. It was something I never expected to see in all my life. This monster came into view, walking on two legs. I wanted to scream, and I could hear my friend start to breathe heavier with fear. It was very tall, maybe seven feet, maybe more. Most of the hair that covered its body was black, but it also had bits of silver or white in the coat. The ears were pointy, very dog-like and it had a snout like a German Shepherd. I immediately thought it was a skinwalker. My abuelo used to tell me all about them. I was certain that this was a skinwalker. What else could it be? It looked skinny, almost malnourished, but the arms and legs looked very powerful, very muscular. It looked very deadly. I could see teeth sticking out of its mouth, like a predatory animal that needs to rip the meat off of another animal. It also had very big clawed fingers on the front arms, and the paws didn't look normal either, more like fingers of a man. It was much too big, much too deadly. 
The back legs looked bent the way that a dog does, so it had a very canine look to it. So I thought to myself, maybe it wasn't a skinwalker. Maybe it was a werewolf. But the moon wasn't even full, or even all the way out. It was only dusk. It had very strange feet, too. Elongated, with what I think were three toes on each foot. It started sniffing the air like it was trying to find prey, and then it started circling our tent, very slowly and quietly, like it didn't want us to know that it was there, or make us run. I honestly thought we would die that night. My friend started tapping me on the shoulder, quietly trying to get my attention. He pointed to a big tree not too far away, and made a motion with his fingers that we needed to run for the tree and climb up into it. I didn't think we would have a better plan. It was only a matter of time before it followed our scent to the bushes. We quietly counted to three and slowly tried to creep away from the bushes, but of course, there were too many sticks and leaves on the ground to be quiet. I know that monster heard us because it snapped its head to our direction and looked right at us. My blood turned to ice. It snarled at us and we heard the most awful growl ever. It felt like it vibrated inside of me. It stood up straight and stared at us. It had the most evil look on its face, but also like it understood what we were and how scared we were. I swear it looked to me like this thing was smiling a twisted evil smile. I could see a mouthful of razor sharp teeth. It had yellow eyes that seemed to stare right through me. We both started to run towards the tree and neither of us looked back because when we got to the tree and started climbing it, we didn't know if it was chasing us or not. We looked around when we felt we were high enough, but neither of us could see that beast, and it was beginning to get dark. When night came and the moon lifted into the sky, we still refused to climb down the tree. We had no idea where that thing was or if it was still out there watching us. We also had no flashlights, so we couldn't look around. The flashlights were still in our tent. We stayed huddled together in that tree all night long. Neither of us slept. Once in a while, we would hear something big walking around near us, but we had no idea if it was that beast or not. Several times, we would catch that awful smell again and figured it was still out there somewhere. It never attacked us though, and it never tried to climb the tree. I don't even know if they can climb trees because they're so big. I wouldn't be surprised if they could though. I prayed a lot that night. I wished I could just be back at my house with my family. I was worried that I was going to die, and that would crush my mother. I thought I was going to eat us both. It never came to hurt us, though. If it was out there, maybe it was just curious. Neither of us were harmed. When morning came and the forest was light again, we decided that we could climb down. When we did, we ran all the way out of the woods. We didn't turn back to look, and we didn't take any of our possessions. When we got home, I was punished for lying and making my mother worry all night. It turns out, our mothers talked the night before and found out our lie. I told my parents everything, and they didn't believe me. My father just went back out into the forest to get the tent and our things. When he came back, he said there were large prints all around our tent, and that he found the large tree we'd been in. There were large prints around that tree too, but it wasn't something that he could identify. Because of the way that our parents reacted when we told them, my friend and I decided it would be best to keep what we saw to ourselves, and it stayed that way for years, until we were able to comfortably fight back when people called us liars. I still don't like talking about it much though, because the memory of it scares me very badly. You don't just forget something like that. This happened to me in Colorado on February 9th, 2017. I'm 24 years old and male and live in the middle of nowhere, literally. I'll be short and simple about my encounter. I was getting home late one night from dropping my sister off at the airport in Lamar, Colorado. I live just seven miles north of the Oklahoma border on 250 acres of land. I have a trap line running around my property for the coyotes. The first two traps I checked were empty, so I headed south. 
That's when I saw this thing. At first, I thought it was a coyote, but a really, really big coyote. It was almost five feet tall on all fours and was caught in one of my traps. It was running around making a dust cloud and then it stopped and looked at me. I use a Duke number no. three leg hold trap so I can catch a variety of things in it. Anyway, I slammed on my brakes and my truck stalled. It's a manual. I was fumbling for the keys to start it and it's an old farm truck with a carburetor so it has a quite loud after fire. Once this thing heard me, it looked at me again and roared. I saw that it's hand, mind you I said hand, not paw, it was caught in my trap. It was his right hand to be exact. It would probably been looking for the dead rabbit that I had in the hole next to it. And then it stood up and ripped the earth anchors completely out of the ground. I had 24 inches underground and it yanked them right out like it was nothing. It took me a long time to put them in with a 10 pound hammer, but this thing pulled them straight out within 15 seconds. After it did that, it actually raised up on two legs and just stood there staring at me. This thing was enormous, bigger than me, more muscular and taller too. I didn't know what the hell I was looking at. It was covered in thick fur that was a mixture of different shades of brown. There was black and tan mixed in it too. It had a snout like a canine and big ears that were moving back and forth. And like I said earlier, this thing didn't have paws on the front legs. It had hands, really big, powerful hands by the looks of it too. The way it was standing looked like the way a dog stands on its toes. And it had this abnormally long abdominal area. It felt like an eternity and I knew my 357 would do nothing to stop this thing if it came at me. I prayed to God that it wouldn't come for me in my truck. I was just looking at this thing in shock and awe and noticed it had these orange colored eyes. They weren't glowing, but instead they had a tint like a cat's eyes in the dark. They may have actually been reflecting my headlights, but I can't be sure. And then it took a step towards me curled up its upper lip and showed me its teeth. They were huge. The longest had to be four or five inches long. And then it growled at me. And then it was gone in the blink of an eye. It moved like lightning. It took these big strides, still on two legs, and it looked like it could catch anything that it wanted to. I was scared absolutely crapless that night. I jammed the truck into gear, spun the tires, and got the hell out of Dodge. Like I said earlier, it seemed like an eternity that I was staring at this thing, but it couldn't have lasted more than 30 seconds at max. Later, I returned to the area with a Native American friend of mine who's part Arapaho. I grew up with him, and I trusted him. He told me stories that were passed down from his grandparents' tribe, and he mentioned something about a loop garu. He also told me how fur trappers in the late 17 and 1800s were actually chased off land in the Rockies because of this thing. I used to work about 10 to 11 at night, but now I sleep with the lights on. It sounds silly for a 24 year old man to be doing that, but to be honest to God, I'm still frightened by this thing. I haven't bothered going out looking for my traps because I bet that thing tore them apart by now. This happened to me years and years ago, but I still remember it like it was just yesterday. I encountered one of those dogman creatures when I was a teenager back in 1995, during a summer at church camp, no less. I was working as a counselor there at the time, and there'd been a few reports before I had my own encounter. I just chalked it up to urban legends or whatever, really. My name is Macy, and this encounter happened to me in Maine. I would prefer you kept the exact location between us because it's private property. This was my second summer at this camp. I was 17 at the time and getting ready to start my senior year of high school. I'd been coming to this camp for a long time though, starting as a camper, then a volunteer, and then a counselor, which again was my second year. 
The year before I had my encounter was the first time I'd ever heard anything regarding this creature. A little boy had come back from the lake and was crying because he was so upset. I mean, this kid was actually terrified. He was shaking and refused to go back outside. The youth pastor, a guy named Pastor Matt, was in charge of all of us and sat him down and tried to get him to tell us what happened. He told us that he saw a monster. I remember Pastor Matt and I exchanging a look. Neither of us really thought that he'd seen an actual monster. Of course there's big wild animals out there, so we just assumed that it was a misidentification. Pastor Matt explained to him that monsters weren't real, and that he probably just saw some wild animal. This poor kid was adamant though that he saw a monster. He described it as a really big wolf, walking around on two legs just like a man does. He said it had a lot of muscles and brown fur. It had big ears and a long snout, and it was watching him from across the lake. Then it turned around and walked back into the forest, still on its hind legs. Now, this kid wasn't the only one there at the lake, of course. It was a group activity, but he was the only one to have seen it. One of the counselors brought him back to the bunks, a guy named Terry. He'd heard him yell out and start crying, so he brought him back to Pastor Matt. He was so scared that he ended up leaving camp just a couple days later and refused to go back out into the lake until his parents came and picked him up. I felt really bad for him. This was supposed to be a fun experience and he was so traumatized that he actually left. I still wasn't convinced that there was a monster out there though. Little did I know that the next year I'd have my very own encounter. His story always stuck with me though because he was so terrified. I often wondered what kind of animal he saw out there that convinced him it was a monster. But again, I just assumed it was a bear or something. I know they can walk on their back legs. So the summer starts where I have my own encounter. I've been there about two weeks by now. We'd finished a day on the lake, already had dinner, did the gospel around the fire, and the kids were in their bunks for the night. It was just after lights out, and that's when the counselors could have a little free time and enjoy the campground themselves. I was down at the lake again. I always liked to sit on the dock and read when I had free time. My friend Jesse had come down to the dock this time though to hang out with me, so we were just sitting on the dock chatting about starting our last year of high school and just catching up. She lived in another town and we usually only got to see each other during these camp seasons. At the same time, we both started getting this uneasy feeling, like we were being watched. Everything also went absolutely quiet. It was so eerie, in fact, that Jesse actually grabbed my hand and gasped. The two of us stood up and looked around. I was sure that it was someone out there trying to sneak up on us, like Terry or one of the other guys, but I couldn't see anybody. We shined our flashlights all around, and I actually called out to see if anybody was there and told them that it wasn't funny. I suddenly had this big realization what kind of situation we could be in. I mean, it was just like one of those Jason movies where the counselors are out on the dock in the dark and you start hearing that creepy noise he makes. Except, what we saw next wasn't Jason. In fact, Jason probably would have been less scary because what we saw looked like an actual honest-to-God werewolf. Because everything else was so quiet, we could make out what sounded like really heavy footsteps and maybe something even growling. When we finally found out what was making the noise, our flashlight seemed to hit it at the same time. Jesse was the first to scream, although I didn't follow far behind. This thing had to be eight feet tall. It was so big, I couldn't even believe that it was real. It was just like the kid the last year described. My first thought, he was right. He wasn't lying. There is a monster in this forest. It looked like a wolf standing on two legs, and it was heading in our direction. It had enormous muscles, especially in the neck and the legs. The arms swayed back and forth as it walked, and they seemed really long. I didn't get a good look at the hands, but after hearing all these other encounters, I can assume what they looked like. It had a snarl on its face, and all these sharp teeth showing in its mouth. The eyes illuminated in our flashlight and they looked like an orange color to me. 
This thing really was a brown color, and the hair was shaggy. It actually looked like it had long hair on the back of its head and around its neck. When the flashlights hit it, it took a step back and growled at us again. I'm not good with distance by any means, so this would be a very gross estimate, but it was maybe half a football field away from us and right next to the water's edge. Both of us started screaming and we took off up the path that leads to the lake in the camp. Both of us were crying and out of breath, but we made it the whole way without stopping. When we got back to the bunk, we shared the story with the other girls. They could tell that we were upset and they wanted to know it was wrong. So Jesse and I told the other three girls everything. And all three of them actually started laughing because they thought we were just trying to scare them and add to the story the boy told last summer, like we were trying to make our own urban legend or something. About a week later, another group of kids came back from the lake, all hysterical and all talking about the werewolf that they saw. They said that they seen the werewolf that was walking on its hind legs on the other side of the lake again, and all of them were talking about wanting to go home. Every single one of those kids described the exact same thing that Jesse and I had seen. There was no way they could have found out what we saw and were trying to make up a story, because we never told any of the kids what we saw, and none of the other counselors or Pastor Matt would have told them either. At this point, Pastor Matt had called a meeting with the counselors and the rest of the staff, and he started discussing sending the kids home because of all the sightings with what he was still convinced was a bear. He said it was just getting too close to the camp and we needed to make sure that nobody got hurt. So we ended up doing that. We closed the camp and all the parents came and picked up their kids early. That was my last summer there. I couldn't go back after what we saw that night. I know the camp opened again the next year and from what I heard, one of the male counselors, this big football player, saw that thing again and he was so worked up, he left the morning after his encounter. He refused to go back. That camp shut down a while ago now. I was told because they lost funding, but part of me doesn't believe that. I can't help but think that more people saw what we did and decided it wasn't safe for anyone else to be out there. I know it's private property, so I doubt a lot of people can actually get to this spot. I don't know what the owner of the property is doing with the land now, but for all I know, maybe the owner was the werewolf that everybody kept seeing. It could be a werewolf, I guess, or it could be Dogman. Either way, I know that there's things out there that people can't explain and don't want to believe are real. But believe me, I saw something that I could only have dreamt up in one of my nightmares. And even though this happened so long ago, I still have nightmares about it sometimes. I'm a lot older now. I'm married. My kids are almost grown up, actually. They know about this story. I told them when they were pretty young, just to warn them about what could be in the woods. We do still go out and camp, but we are armed, and we're always on the lookout for something supernatural. I just couldn't help but get them prepared, just in case they saw something as nightmarish as I did. Thank you for telling my story. I really hope that this story can shed some light on some other people's encounters, and maybe even bring forward some people that are too scared to tell their own. Don't forget to check out my new book, now available on Amazon.com, on Kindle, paperback, and hardcover. The link is on the description of this episode below.